Hi, I'm Richard Sever of Cold Spring Harbor Lab. With me I have Ben Neal, who heads the Perlmutter Cancer Center at NYU Langone uh, Medical School. Ben, welcome Hi, to Cold Spring Harbor. Thanks, great to be here. Now, I'm, I'm really interested to talk with you because um, you're, you're going to be talking about phosphatases later in the, in the meeting, but um, you have this kind of broad perspective and um, if you don't mind me saying, you, you've been in the game for a long time. Thanks, I guess that's another way of saying I'm old. <laughs> But I mean, if you if you re I mean, you know, thinking of your work um, uh, uh, in identification of MYC a long a long time ago, yeah. um, and those early days of oncogenes, if you look back to like 1980 and you think yeah. how far we've come, um, uh, do you think we've come far enough? Do you, uh, have we not moved as far as you'd hoped, or have we yeah. done everything you hoped? Well, obviously, um, you know, cancer is probably now the number one cause of death in the United States, so we clearly haven't come far enough. Um, that being said, um, I think the road that's been traveled has been amazing uh, in the last, you know, 35 years. I mean, it's, it's hard to believe, you know, for somebody who came here as a graduate student to give my first scientific talk, you know, in 1980, as you said, um, you know, when we didn't know, uh, we hadn't cloned a single human gene yet, and, you know, now we have the whole genome. We, we only knew, if we didn't, we, we really didn't know a single human gene that caused cancer, um, you know, until the year after that, when we first heard about, you know, RAS. Uh, later in the, in the year, um, and, and now we have basically a complete map of the human genome. We have a complete, you know, list, pretty much almost complete, if not complete, list of all the genes that are, you know, either activated or inactivated in cancer. We know about epigenetic modifications in cancer, and we have just such a more sophisticated um, understanding of cell biology and tumor biology and the interaction with all kinds of host cells. Um, and for the first time, I think we really do have. Um, if not a roadmap, at least a pretty good map of, of what to do to go forward to try to make uh, you know major impact on the, on this disease, and we're and we're seeing it. We're seeing it in the clinic, and we're seeing you know cures and uh, cures that are given ration that are developed rationally, not just by empirical chemotherapy. So you um, so you're optimistic that that kind of the the molecular dissection that's given us that map is giving us targets for precise therapy that's actually working. Well, no, I don't, I don't necessarily think, actually, ironically, I think that it's the, that the targeted therapy and use of, com of combination tar targeted therapy, I'm less enthusiastic about being curative. I think that there's going to be a role for targeted therapy for sure, uh, and, and figuring out how to integrate targeted therapy with other forms of therapy like epigenetic manipulation and, and the big the big advance in the last five years, of course, is uh, immunotherapy or tumor immunology. Figuring out how to integrate all of those uh, different modalities uh, is really the key to, you know, making major progress in the next 15 years. And I, and I am optimistic. I really think that, you know, um, I mean, if I weren't optimistic, I wouldn't let our cancer center, you know, put out an advertisement that says we can cure cancer, because I, I do think we can cure cancer. We already do cure can some cancers, and I think that, you know, we're going to see increasing numbers of cancers cured in, in the next 15 years. And even more importantly, I think we'll be able to prevent a lot of cancers, or at least not, if not prevent them, detect them earlier so that they're not as dangerous um, and that um, they don't develop into the full-blown metastatic state that is, is, you know, what we face all too often now. Well, one of the landmarks on, on, the, on that map is, um, is a particular phosphatase, PTP1B, um, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. but. Um, before we get to that, can you just disabuse people of the notion that phosphatases are just there to mop up after kindness? Yeah, well, if I did, I mean, I'm sitting at Cold Spring Harbor, which is, um, you know, the home of Nick Tonks, who's the founder <laughs> of the phosphatase field. I like to call him the granddaddy of the phosphatase field, but then he gets upset because I'm older than he is. But um, so if, if I didn't disabuse him of that, I might not survive the meeting. Um, but yes, I mean, I think, you know, uh, phosphatases play a critical role as both positive and negative regulators. And, you know, kinases can be inhibitors. So I think that, you know, all of us who work in the signaling field have a, you know, more sophisticated understanding than just plus or minus signs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. And, and PTP1B, this is a tyrosine kinase that yes, we're talking tyrosine about. Yes, tyrosine phosphatase. Tyrosine phosphatase. Right? Tyrosine phosphatase. I, made the classic I used to say error. phosphatase is a Rodney Dangerfield of signal transduction. We don't get any respect, but. Uh, <laughs> right, so. right. But I sometimes laugh and call them kinases too, and then I really feel bad. So, so well, I apologize. Um, so, you, you've been looking at this in um, uh, HER2 dependent model of breast cancer. Right. Is correct. Right. And um, it's, it seems that. In, again, in this case, the, the, the phosphatase is not shutting things down. It right. seems like when you shut, shut the phosphatase down, you're actually inhibiting 
the uh, potential for the, the tumor to survive. Yeah, that that's right, and that was a really big surprise because we know a lot about, so PTP1B actually is a reasonably recent addition to the map you know, for cancer biology because it was best understood as an enzyme that regulates uh, body mass and glucose homeostasis. It's a major regulator of the insulin receptor and a major regulator of the kinase that's associated with the leptin receptor, which is a major um, control of, um, which is a major controller of body mass regulation in the brain. So um, almost all the work on PTP1B, you know, up until the last five to ten, maybe eight years uh, ago, was focused on PTP1B's role in uh, in sort of total body metabolism and. Uh, and, and the idea of targeting PTP1B was mainly um, for the possibility of weight reduction and or uh, diabetes therapy. Uh -huh. um, but about eight years ago now, um, both our group and Michelle Tremblay's lab in, at McGill uh, made the unexpected discovery that PTP1B deficiency actually um, antagonizes uh, uh, HER2 new mediated transformation in mice. And, um, we didn't really agree. We agreed on the biology. We didn't really agree on the uh, on the mechanism, and, and uh, um, that's what led to the studies that we did now, more recently, on human HER2 positive breast cancers, which suggests a, a, a totally unexpected connection between PTP1B and this unusual rare disease called Moya Moya syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, and and a very interesting class of enzymes that are called alpha ketoglutarate dependent dioxygenases. So that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. And, and so you say in your abstract that the, the phosphatase um, allows the uh, cells to survive hypoxia, is that correct? Right. The, in severe hypoxia, tumors actually um, are uh, put in a very stressful situation most of the time. They, they often are quite hypoxic, they're nutrient depleted, uh, and in order to survive those uh, conditions, they have to buffer those conditions molecularly in some way. And, and uh, survival in hypoxia has been pretty well understood due to the work of a large number of very important investigators over the last 20 years or 15 years. And the sort of signature molecule that controls hypoxia regulation is HIF and then the unfolded protein response and then the TOR pathway. These three pathways at different levels of, hy of tumor hypoxia um, control the ability or, or allow the tumor to survive uh, in, in, under those conditions. But what we found was that there was a, a, a fourth pathway, if you will, um, that involved PTP1B um, and this unusual E3 ligase, RNF213, at really severe levels of hypoxia. So this is not going through the, I mean, one, one typically thinks about hy hypoxia responses, one thinks of the von Hippel lindell right. factor and, right. and the HIF transcription factor, so this right. does not involve that? No, as far as we can tell, and in fact, we, for, for HIF, we're absolutely sure that there's no difference because we actually went to the trouble of, of getting one of these commercial profiling kits where you look at 98 HIF regulated genes and there's uh, you know like a 99% concordance between the response of HIF regulated genes and PTP1B depleted cell lines versus um, PTP replete cell lines and there's no shared gene So that's it's different. not even convergence, it's actually no, completely No, it's a completely different, different it appears to be a completely different pathway and we think it has a completely different function. So, you know, if you look at the purpose of the HIF pathway, sort of from the 50,000 foot level, its job is to control, um, you know, mitochondrial oxygen consumption, to turn down mitochondrial uh, consumption of oxygen by mitochondria through oxidative phosphorylation, which is very energy intensive and oxygen intensive, and to shift metabolism into a glycolytic state. That's what the HIF pathway does mm -hmm. at sort of the 50,000 foot level. And then the second major pathway that comes in into play is the unfolded protein response or um, ER stress pathway, and that comes into play at more severe hypoxia. And what that seems to do is to basically, at, again, at a simplified level, control um, oxygen consumption in the endoplasmic the reticulum. Uh, for protein refolding and, and other um, ER oxidative processes. And then the third major pathway is the TOR pathway, or the AMPK uh, TOR pathway. And again, the purpose of that pathway is to basically control excess energy consumption by protein and lipid synthesis. And what we found was that um, that there's actually, well, we didn't find this, but it's actually we actually heard a little bit about it uh, just a couple minutes ago from Sean Morrison, that there's a large family of enzymes. Um, there's about 
60 to 80 of these enzymes in mammalian cells that are called alpha ketoglutarate dependent dioxygenases. And these enzymes carry, these enzymes use molecular oxygen, but they're non mitochondrial oxygen consumption. And it's been typically thought that these. Um, so, where's it taking place? It's though? taking place in the. Some of these are in the cytoplasm, some of these are probably in the mitochondria too. Mm -hmm. um, but they are basically non mitochondrial. They're not really mitochondria, they're not oxidative phosphorylation and all electron transport. So, you know, when you get to severe levels of oxygen consumption, you have to make sure that these enzymes aren't um, expressed at, uh, or aren't active uh, at a very high level. So, um, otherwise you consume the oxygen in the local microenvironment and the cells die. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, what we found was that PTP1B deficient cells um, have an excess rate, of uh, excess level of non-mitochondrial oxygen consumption. And this non-mitochondrial oxygen consumption could be suppressed um, by using inhibitors of the alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenase activity and by several biochemical assays it appeared as if there was increased activity of uh, several members of this family including probably the TET family demethylases. So, um, and then that was one surprise and then the, the really big surprise was the connection which we still don't understand the molecular detail between um, PTP1B and the alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenase appears to be this large E3 ligase at 600 kilodaltons called RNF213. Um, and that's a tyrosine phosphoprotein, we, and we think that PTP1B dephosphorylates specific site or sites on that protein, although we don't know the exact site yet. But if we deplete alpha ketoglutarate, if we deplete RNF213, we can completely rescue the excess non mitochondrial oxygen consumption, the um, increased activity of those alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenases, and we can restore hypoxia induced survival uh, you know, in culture uh, and to a, a substantial extent restore tumor genesis and all the hypoxia, excess hypoxia in the tumor. So we don't know the exact pathway and that's why it's kind of novel and exciting, but we think that um, you know, that's the major new pathway. And in the, I want to emphasize that in these cells and in these tumors, all, as far as we can tell, all of the other pathways are turned on normally or even precociously. So we don't see that there's, um, at least as far as we can tell at this point, there's no obvious connection to the other pathways. And we think it's because, you know, this is a, a, another set of oxygen consuming enzymes. And although under ambient oxygen or even mild hypoxia, they don't contribute a lot. Under severe hypoxia, they probably do become limiting. Mm -hmm. And um, in the deep recesses of my memory, I recall that alpha ketoglutarate is, is part of the TCA cycle. Is yes. there a me metabolic connection there beyond just oxygen? Um, well, I mean, alpha ketoglutarate has a lot of roles, and I think that, as you saw from Sean's talk, the one role that's been, you know, hasn't been, you know, thought of that much is uh, is the, is its role as a substrate in the alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenase reactions, and so. You know, I think that it's it's not really a it's a, it's a completely separate role of this of this metabolite. So and, the, and the more general connection with uh, metabolism that you referred to earlier for PTP one B. Yeah. What does what does that say in terms of looking at PTP one B as a target in cancer? Is yeah, that I advantage? think that. Yeah, I mean, I think well, you know, um, I think that based on the original work that both our lab and Michelle's lab did. There's already been discussion about you know um, testing PTP one B inhibitors in in. Uh, you know, uh, in cancer, and in fact, uh, I, I believe that Coltsman Harbor, you know, has uh, licensed in a compound that was originally developed by a biotech company, and and um, are starting a trial in in, uh, in her two positive breast cancer, uh, or have already started it. So that's been the other sort of exciting events in the PPD field is that you know for the first time um, there are actually some real bona fide PTP inhibitors. Um, interestingly. Uh, the only bona fide ones that I believe are, are both allosteric inhibitors and they have actually managed to get around the major limitation um, for PTP targeting um, by small molecules which has been the highly reactive nature um, uh, and polar nature of the active site. So um, I think we're also, also going to see very shortly um, work from a biotech company, from a pharmaceutical company reporting a, uh, a, a, a really uh, interesting SHP2 inhibitor which is another major interest in my lab. Um, and also um, having activity, at least in preclinical models, for cancer. Well, it's it's great to hear that um, phosphatase, phosphatases are getting their time in the They, uh, they finally are. At the, as in the twilight of my career, uh, phosphatases are hot again. So I mean, I've been called by a lot of investors. They want to start phosphatase companies, or and there's already several companies that are working on phosphatase targets now. So it's kind of funny. It's like well, a, it's like a rebirth. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear. We wish you the best of luck with that. Thanks a lot, great Richard. Talking to you, Thanks.